Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon in, in the conference of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy, ASCII. This is panel number four, so at least some of you have been with us before, and you know that I am Sylvia Pedraza, Professor of Sociology and American Culture at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, I was introduced yesterday by Larry, so I need not go into any depth in the introduction. I do want to mention, though, because Larry did not mention it yesterday, that I do have a forthcoming book that compares the Cuban and the Venezuelan revolutions together. And my co-author is Carlos Antonio Romero, who's at the Universidad Central de Venezuela. And the reason I am interested in your knowing about the book, it's forthcoming with the University of Florida Press. Uh, Carlos is in Caracas, and we actually met and began working on, on this during an ASCII conference. So the book is kind of like an ASCII baby. <laughs> so I wanted you to know about it. And this is also a, you know, ASCII, there's a lot of interest in the Cuban and Venezuelan connection. So that's enough about me. And I just want to int introduce Carlos Segle to you, um, because he will go on to introduce Alejandro and um, everybody else. Carlos Segle is professor and former chair of the economics department at Rutgers University in Newark. In addition, he is on the faculty of the Division of Global Affairs, where he served as program director. He is also an affiliated faculty member of the Center for Latin American Studies at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. He received his BA degree from Rutgers. You have been at Rutgers for a long time and his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. His research interests include applied microeconomics, defense economics, and international economics. He has taught at Columbia University, the Helsinki School of Economics, which is now called Alto University School of Economics, the University of Alicante, and the Université Pierre Mendes France in Grenoble. Uh, Carlos Segle is the author of more than 50 referee journal articles and book chapters and serves on the editorial boards of several journals. He was past president of ASCII, uh, a club that I will soon be joining. Thank you, Carlos. You're muted, Carlos. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. So I want to say something about, uh, well, first, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, I want to say something about Carlos de Alejandro. Uh, he was born on July 18, 1937 in Havana, Cuba. He did his undergraduate degree at Miami University in Ohio, and he began his studies in 1957 at MIT, finishing them in 1961 at the age of 24. He began his teaching career right after that at Yale University, then moved on to the University of Minnesota, and then returned to Yale at 32 years old, becoming the youngest full professor in economics there. Uh, when I, had, I met him when he, had, he left Yale, then he went to Columbia University in 1983. And right before his 48th birthday, he was leaving Columbia to go to Harvard. Not only was uh, Carlos a brilliant scholar, but he was also a policy advisor to the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America, the World Bank, and many other institutions. And right before he, his death, he also served uh, on the National Bipartisan Commission on Central America, also known as the Kissinger Commission. So uh, over, and we've had over, over all these years, we've had the privilege of having some of the most renowned economists given the Carlos Alejandro Diaz, Diaz Alejandro Lecture. We've also had other prominent academics in fields such as, uh, in other fields, such as Alejandro Portes and Pedro Sanchez. In this tradition, we have the great pleasure of having Professor Alejandro de la Fuente as this year's speaker. Professor de la Fuente is the Robert Woods Bliss Professor of Latin American History and Economics and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He is the founding director of the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at the Hutchings Center for African and African-American Research, 
and the chair of the Cuba Studies Program at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Study at Harvard University. A historian of Latin America in the Caribbean who specializes in the study of comparative slavery and race relations, Professor De La Fuente's work on race, slavery, law, art, and Atlantic history have been published in Spanish, English, Portuguese, Italian, German, and French. He is the author of Becoming Free, Becoming Black, Race, Freedom, and Law in Cuba, Virginia, and Louisiana, Cambridge University Press. He's also, uh, the, he's also written uh, Havana and the Atlantic uh, in the 16th century, published by the University of North Carolina Press, and of A Nation for All, Race, Inequality, and Politics in 20th Century uh, Cuba, also published by the University of North Carolina Press. He is the co-editor with George Reed Andrews of Afro-Latin American Studies, an introduction uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, and is also available in Spanish and in Portuguese, and also the Afro-Latin American book series published by Cambridge University Press. He's also the curator of three art exhibits dealing with issues of race and the author or editor of their corresponding volumes. Geloides, Keloides, Race and Re Racism in Cuban Contemporary Art, Drapetomi, uh, Dra Drapetomania, Grupo Antillano and the Art of Afro-Cuba, and uh, finally, Diago, Diago, The Past of this Afro-Cuban Present, uh, by uh, also done in Cambridge and uh, Miami, and it's going ongoing right now. So I want to introduce you to uh, the distinguished uh, colleague here, uh, Professor Alejandro de la Fuente, who's kind enough to be able to give uh, this year's lecture. Thank you so much, Carlos, um, for your Thanks. kind introduction. This, uh, these introductions keep, um, um, they keep getting longer with years, you know. Um, and thank you to Silvia Pedraza, um, as president of ASCII, for the invitation to be with us. Um, with you this year. I, I was, um, we were supposed to be in Miami and I was certainly looking forward to doing this in person there. That was not possible, but at the same time, doing it in this format also gives us the opportunity to reach out to colleagues who are uh, in other places and who can now be with us to those colleagues. I, I thank you all for, uh, for joining us. And I also thank my colleague and friend, Tania Hernandez for agreeing to provide um, comments and uh, for joining us. Um, I think it is appropriate that in the times we live um, that we devote the Carlos Diaz Alejandro lecture this year uh, to the always difficult question of race and racism in Cuban contemporary society. We live in times in which um, the disadvantages that people of African descent continue to experience across the Americas have been painfully uh, visible both uh, because of um, racialized uh, police violence and also because of the current pandemic, which as you all know, is having a differential impact on, on people of African descent, not only in the US by the way, but also in Latin America uh, as well. My presentation is based on a recent text, on a recent article that I have finished um, with uh, my colleague, sociologist uh, Stanley Bailey from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, Stan Bailey is a well-known scholar of race and racial attitudes in Latin America, particularly in Brazil. Um, but we've been doing work together on Cuba for a couple of years, um, for a couple of years now. He's uh, very, very good with numbers, which of course I'm not. So uh, um, we've been collaborators for a very, very long time. Uh, it, is a, it is a work that builds on my long-term interest on, on race and inequality in, in Cuba. Um, when I finished A Nation for All, uh, my goodness, almost uh, 20 years uh, ago, I finished that, that book with something of a puzzle. On the one hand, my research showed that, um, that the Cuban revolution had had me measurable impact on uh, on important metrics of racial inequality in Cuba and that it had produced by the 1980s a society that in, in several important ways was racially egalitarian uh, 
much more egalitarian certainly than, than other multiracial societies um, in the Americas. But the final chapter of that book dealt with the 1990s and with the so-called special period. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, crisis that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the so-called uh, special uh, uh, period, um, racially differentiated effects became immediately visible and painfully uh, visible. Um, it's um, it's um, all Cubans, regardless of uh, social condition of personal circumstances, were forced to deal with a very different environment in Cuba in the 1990s after the collapse of the, of the socialist welfare state. Uh, but the crisis produced racially differentiated effects uh, immediately. Um, in part because whites immediately mobilized, many white Cubans immediately mobilized uh, racial narratives, racist ideologies, racist epithets in order to exclude Afro-Cubans from the new sectors of the Cuban economy, from the most desirable sectors of the Cuban economy, tourist-related uh, tourist uh, activities, and also the sort of joint venture um, companies that finance with global capital began to emerge particularly in Havana uh, in the early to mid uh, 1990s. In this context, uh, uh, ideologies, openly racist ideologies that described Afro-Cubans as incapable of, of contributing to the new uh, dollarized uh, and globalized economy and that um, depicted them as prone to criminality, as lazy, began to circulate widely and began to play a role in excluding them from those uh, most desirable sectors of the Cuban economy. Um, it was also a moment in which uh, ideologies that are very well known to scholars of race in the Americas about beauty and buena presencia were also mobilized in order to exclude uh, otherwise qualified Afro-Cuban uh, candidates for these, uh, for these um, positions. So the, the, the racial polarization and the racialization of the crisis in the 1990s, which is where I ended the book, uh, raised uh, serious and uncomfortable questions about Cuban socialism, about the impact and the enduring impact of the egalitarian policies that, the, that Cuban socialism had been implementing since uh, the 1960s. At the very least, it became impossible to argue uh, that race and discrimination were no issues in Cuban society. But how come um, after several decades of egalitarian social policies, Cubans were so familiar with racist idioms and epithets that they could readily use them as soon as needed, as soon as they had to compete for jobs and scarce resources in the 1990s. What made these loaded epithets uh, and these racist narratives intelligible and culturally not only possible but plausible? Uh, how did the racial equality of the 1980s correlate or connect with um, um, the racist practices and the derogatory discourses that circulated widely and openly uh, in the 1990s? So the Cuban revolutionary process allows us to ask uh, a particularly vexing question. It's a question that I've been struggling with for quite some time now. And that question is, can racism coexist with equality? We now have much better data to uh, approach this question uh, than when I finished A Nation for All uh, 20 years ago, thanks in part to the existence of two new censuses in 2002 and 2012, which when, when used in conjunction with the 1981 census, which uh, all these censuses collected information according to skin color using somewhat different methodologies, but they all collected information, it gives us an opportunity to, um, to now um, reconstruct better a broader picture about how inequality may have evolved in Cuban society since the 1980s. Incidentally, let me, uh, let me share it with you. Um, I hope you can see this. Yes, 
Thank you, Tanya. I was looking at, I was seeing you there. Um, uh, the fact that basically the, the, in terms of the racial composition of the, of the population, there have not been major changes. There has been a sort of a long-term, now secular trend, which is not unique in Latin America, by the way, of decline of the white population, a very slow decline of the white proportion of the total population. But then the increase is not really of the so-called negros um, uh, by the census, but the mestizos or mulatos. But overall, we have a, a, a population structure according to, to race, which has remained, um, which has remained fairly stable uh, since the 1980s. Basically, two thirds of the population is white, one third is non-white. Of that non-third, about 10% is black, and the other 20 or so percent is mestizo or mulatto, which are the two labels that the census uses. Uh, the 2002 census used mestizo, the 2012 used, uh, used uh, um, mulatto. Um, these measurements also give us an, um, an opportunity to participate in the current debates and the current conversations that are taking place in Cuban society right now. And as always with Cuba, these conversations are characterized by enormous polarization and by the existence of uh, radically different, if not opposing, uh, points of views. On the one hand, um, on the one hand, Cuban government officials continue to portray, to speak of race and of racism and discrimination as um, a problem that basically does not exist in Cuban uh, society. In their uh, report to the Committee Against Racial Discrimination, the United Nations Committee Against Racial Discrimination in 2018, um, the Cuban uh, official in charge of this, uh, of delivering this report uh, uh, stated, and I'm going to, to quote, in Cuba, there is no institutionalized or structural racial discrimination, end of the quote. Um, this, um, this official went on to explain this based on the mestizo nature of the Cuban people. Somos un pueblo mestizo, and because we are a pueblo mestizo, there is no racism or, or discrimination here. And also uh, argued that um, the principle of equality is enshrined in all the legislation, all the legal structures and the principles of, uh, of uh, the Cuban revolution. Cuban authorities recognize now more than they did before um, the possible existence of some discriminatory practices or ideas, but they refer to these as vestiges, you know, remanentes, vestigios uh, of, uh, of something that still subsists. This is the other the verb that is frequently used, something that you know, something that subsists is something that is, um, that you get the sense that it's somehow on its way out. It's, it's about to disappear. It's not, it, it's not living in a propitious uh, um, environment. As the, same, as the same official said uh, in his report, I quote, even though our country eliminated structural and institutional racial discrimination, racial prejudice subsists in the behavior and expressions of a limited number of people. The official report of the 2012 census basically concurs with this view. I, I, I quote, even though there may be vestiges of racism and racial discrimination, the general results of the census do not show differentials between people according to skin color that confirms that this problem has a critical quantitative dimension in Cuban society. End of the quote. Some officials also speak of racism as something of an imported problem, a problem manufactured somewhere else. You can guess where. Um, it's an American problem that has been brought to the island to manufacture divisions in a society in which those divisions do not exist. So that's one side of the debate. On the other hand, I have been working for many years uh, with activists, uh, with anti-racist activists, who have a very different take and a very different, who speak about these problems using a very different language, very different concepts, and very different uh, approaches. 
Uh, these uh, Afro-Cuban intellectuals, mostly, but not exclusively Afro-Cuban intellectuals uh, and organizations contest the notion that uh, racism and discrimination can be reduced to some vestige of the past, to something that remains, and speak about the, how racism is institutionalized in practices and in institutions in Cuban society that continue to marginalize Afro-Cubans and to make Afro-Cubans uh, second-class uh, citizens. They also complain repeatedly and vociferously about the inability of authorities to listen to and to acknowledge their claims uh, and, their, um, and their demands. So since the 1990s, let me go back to my shared screen here. Since the 1990s, um, Cuba has witnessed the emergence of, um, of a number of uh, initiatives, uh, projects, um, organizations um, that eventually coalesced in what I have called an Afro-Cuban uh, movement. Uh, this movement was initially led by, um, by cultural producers, by artists, musicians, mostly in the hip hop uh, in the hip hop movement um, visual artists um, writers uh, filmmakers uh, but it's a movement that later on in the decade began to uh, expand into organizations that were more directly concerned with civil rights and with uh, citizens rights and with the language and art articulated demands in the language of um, uh, of human uh, Right. Um, this movement, uh, which began as a series of, um, you know, disconnected initiatives, uh, uh, people who were trying to develop a language to speak about something that was not supposed to exist in Cuban society. You know, they were talking about the invisible and the non-topic. They were trying to make a non-topic a topic, and they had to develop a language in order to do this, in order to talk to Cuban society about this, that movement has grown enormously in the last 25 uh, years. And now includes, uh, includes um, organizations, projects uh, that follow very different strategies and are operating in many uh, different ways. There are community-based organizations such as Red Barrial uh, Afrodescendiente. There are organizations that offer specialized services such as legal services. Um, like uh, Alianza Unidad Racial. There are organizations and projects that um, pay attention to issues of intersectionality and to the um, particular situation of the LGBTQ uh, community, especially of those of African descent, the way Alianza Racial does. There are many cultural uh, projects and initiatives such as Transe, Mirarte Dia Dia, uh, Afro Palabra. There are self-help um, organizations such as Club del Espendru. There are organizations that articulate demands more in the language of uh, civil rights, uh, human rights, and citizenship rights, such as Cofradía de la Negritud, um, which was created by Norberto Carbonell in 1998, and the Comité Ciudadanos por la Integración Racial, CIR. There are women's rights organizations such as Afrocubanas, which is unfortunately now inactive um, as, as we speak. And then there are also national uh, chapters of transnational organizations, such as Alianza Regional Afrodescendiente de America Latina y, y el Caribe. And this list doesn't even uh, include um, the multitude of religious houses uh, that also function as uh, cult cultural uh, uh, centers and as self-help uh, community centers um, across uh, the island. These are the activists who in the last um, three decades have been raising constantly questions about, um, about how Cuban society continues to be fundamentally racist and how that society continues to create um, conditions and practices that result in the marginalization of Afro-Cubans. Some of them, by the way, uh, commented on the report uh, that I mentioned before, on the Cuban official report, 
to the Committee Against Racial Discrimination in the United Nations and referred to it as, uh, I quote, lamentable and shameful, end of the quote. Um, the image that you are seeing is an image of uh, uh, a fairly large group of these activists, which I had the opportunity to host at Harvard in 2017. Um, and um, I, um, their questions, uh, their experiences inform much of my research. And I have, uh, I happily acknowledge my debt of gratitude my intellectual debt of gratitude to them in terms of informing the questions uh, that inform my research. By the way, there, uh, this is a little advertisement here. Uh, the, um, their positions, their programs, their, uh, their, their declarations, their texts were all published in a special issue of Cuban Studies, Cuban Studies 48, which is completely devoted uh, to the Afro-descendant uh, to the Afro-descendant movement in Cuba. So the question then, the question then becomes, is it at all possible to bridge this um, um, disparate assessments of Cuban uh, society uh, using existing data? Um, could both of these perspectives, the official perspective and the kind of the militant perspective offer representations that are somewhat um, that are somewhat accurate are these representations comp compatible um, they, they they appear to be speaking about two completely different nations about two completely different um, countries I will admit that I approach this research with the expectation um, that um, that the rosy projections of Cuban government officials were fundamentally misleading, and that if anything, they were anchored um, in realities that were perhaps valid in the 1980s, but had um, changed dramatically uh, since then. I must say that my expectation was wrong, and that using census data, it is not so easy to simply dismiss um, officials, the characterizations uh, proposed by Cuban officials as just mere fabrications. It is actually um, more complicated than that. Uh, and I will devote the rest of my presentation to try to lay out some of the evidence uh, for you and, and, and some thoughts uh, about this. But much to my surprise, based on census um, data, Cuba continued to be a fairly egalitarian society into the 21st century, despite the special period. Is that possible? Could that be true? So let me share some, um, let me share some empirical information with you uh, based on census data first. This information comes from um, education, um, some selected uh, occupation, occupational um, data, healthcare, and housing, um, to give you an example of how Cuban society looks through this particular set of data, which uh, admittedly census data is frequently seen as the golden standard for, you know, to estimate, uh, to make estimates of inequality, not only in Cuba, but but everywhere, we've, we've been fighting about the census here <laughs> for good reasons uh, later, lately. So, okay, so let me start with education, which is of course um, one of those paradigmatic areas of, um, of success of the Cuban revolution. You know, if we're going to talk about exitos, education always comes first. And what you can see here is, if it, is that the number of people, the, pro, the number of people who had not completed elementary school, basically, who had not completed any um, uh, school level, was still about a quarter of the population in 1981. That number, that proportion had collapsed to about 5% in 2012, which immediately tells us that this educational system continued to function or would suggest that this educational system continued to function in the 1990s and the 2000s, despite the special period. It continued to have an impact uh, 
on the Cuban population. More important to our purposes, however, is the fact that as I'm sure you can see, uh, that impact is not racially differentiated. That impact basically is similar across the different racial groups. The proportion declines, and it declines for all racial groups in a more or less uh, um, uniform uh, manner. Um, on the other end, if we look at, um, at the number of people with university degrees, it's, um, it's very easy to see that, that that proportion increased dramatically also between 1981 and 2012. And I'm sure you can, you, you can probably, if you look at the numbers, which is why I included them, they are noticed that that, that that growth accelerated between 2002 and 2012. Uh, that's when the, there is really uh, uh, a larger increase in the number of, um, uh, of people obtaining university degrees. Again, for our purposes, the important thing to note here is that these gains uh, happen more or less evenly across the different racial groups. One note uh, here, the growth of the university uh, in, in the number of people uh, with university degrees between 2002 and 2012 is directly linked to the expansion of the Cuban university system between 2000 and 2010, when as part of the so-called Batalla de Ideas, the ideas battle or the ideas war or something, Fidel Castro um, promoted uh, a program of municipalization, la municipalización of, uh, of the Cuban university system. Basically, it created um, opportunities to take university level courses across municipalities all over the island. This of course was done at the, uh, at the expense of quality, needless to say, everybody, this was um, commented on frequently by um, um, educational personnel in Cuba, but it did create opportunities for people across the island in order to, uh, uh, in order to obtain uh, a university degree. So that experiment in massive university education ended in 2010, in part because it wasn't sustainable and in part because of grave uh, concerns about the quality of uh, the degrees that were being obtained through that. Um, but that explains why there is a, 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 a significant growth between 2002 and, 2000, uh, and 2012. Even more surprising is the fact that race differentials are also very low in terms of postgraduate um, education. As you can see, in fact, the number of, um, the proportion of so-called Negros of Blacks with a master's degree is a little higher than the proportion of uh, whites, which is in turn identical to the proportion of, um, of, of mestizos or, or mulattos. And the differences are also fairly small when it comes to, um, um, to, to doctorates, to doctoral degrees, to people obtaining PhDs. Um, so it is difficult to, it's difficult to disagree with the census report when it states, I quote, the difference between whites and non-whites, talking about university education, is of only 0.7%, a figure which is too low to convey that there are inequities or discrimination in access to university education according to skin color. End of the quote. Um, it's uh, the first time I read this. I, I went straight to the data thinking this gotta be wrong. Okay, it appears that, uh, that it's not. And that would explain um, this good news and on the university front according to the census would explain why. Um, the number of non-whites in some of the most prestigious uh, occupations, traditionally most prestigious occupations uh, in the occupational structure, non-whites are actually very well represented in those, uh, in those jobs. Uh, we're talking professionals, scientists, and technicians, which is what appears on the, on the right side uh, on the slide. Um, this was already uh, true in 1981. Uh, when I saw that figure 20 years, 20 plus years ago, I was surprised by the fact that the proportion of blacks and mestizos was basically identical to the proportion of whites in, this, uh, in these jobs. 
But more interestingly enough, this is another area in which the special period appears to have had zero impact in terms both of the proportion of people employed in these activities, which has remained fairly stable, as you can see, between 20 and 25 percent, and also in terms of uh, in terms of the um, of um, the representation of the various uh, racial groups in those um, occupations. So here is another indicator, which, based on census data, would suggest again that Cuba continues continued to be a fairly egalitarian society into the 21st century. This is also true uh, concerning um, life expectancy which as you know, it's a, it's a very potent indicator of social well-being um, and, and social welfare because it relates to infant mortality uh, directly, which is in turn uh, related to access to healthcare, nutrition, education. Many st studies show that female education is a critical predictor of, uh, of infant mortality. Um, this is another area in which a, again, the special period would appear to have made very little impact. The life expectancy of Cubans has increased between 1981 and 2005. These are estimates um, by Albizu Campos, a well-known Cuban demographer um, who worked at the Centro Estudios Demográficos. I'm using his results here and combining them with my own results from 1981. Um, it's not only that life expectancy for Cubans has increased between 1981 and 2005. It's also the fact that differentials by race were minimal in 1981 and although somewhat larger by 2005, continued to be fairly small, particularly in comparison to other multiracial societies in the Americas like Brazil or the United States which, um, by the way, is now the most unequal country on that metric, which is, uh, which is quite amazing. Um, note also that the life expectancy of black Cubans, and this black here includes people otherwise characterized as mestizos or mulattos in the census, that the life expectancy of black Cubans is higher than the life expectancy of Brazilian whites and it's higher also than the life expectancy of African-Americans uh, in the United States. Finally, I looked into housing and here too, much to my surprise, the censuses seem to be telling a story that was not the story, was not what I expected uh, to find. As you can see, um, race differentials are minimal, but in terms of either average household size, average family size, and more surprising to me in terms of the average number of people per bedroom, which is a, a crucial indicator of crowding. Now, if you, if you look at the figures of the, of the average number of people per bedroom, you'll, you'll see uh, that that average has increased by about 30% between 2002 and 2012, even though the Cuban population did not grow at all during those years. So the number of people per bedroom has grown, but the population has remained basically stationary during these years, which of course suggests that the housing stock in the island has deteriorated dramatically during the last, uh, between 2002 and 2012. But again, for our purposes, what I want to highlight is that that deterioration happened across the board and appears to be affecting uh, Cubans of all colors, uh, regardless, um, uh, regardless of, uh, of race. So our results, these results, based on census data, defy almost everything we knew, or perhaps we continue to know, about race and inequality in Cuba since the 1990s. It uh, defies everything I expected to find, and defies pretty much everything I was, I was announcing without having much hard data in that final chapter of A Nation for All uh, 20 years ago. This data would represent a major correction or a major corrective to what I was announcing uh, 
then. Um, this data continues, portrays a nation that overall is uh, fundamentally egalitarian, and it's egalitarian in a number of important areas, such as access to education, access to health care, occupational structure, um, even, even housing, even access to uh, more or less equal housing. Uh, I should add that on top of that, uh, the representation of Blacks, uh, of so-called Negros and Mestizos or Mulatos, in the top echelons of the government has also increased during the last uh, 30 years to the point that today Blacks and Mestizos are basically represented according to their proportion in the population in organs such as the Asamblea Nacional del Poder Popular or uh, the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Out of uh, six vice presidents of the Council of State, three are people of African descent, and two of them uh, are women. I remember being asked at some point by a journalist uh, from the New York Times whether this was window dressing, and I replied, maybe, but if the window gets dressed in black, I'll take it. Um, so how is this possible? Are these figures misleading in any way? Are they compatible with uh, what we are hearing from our collaborators in the anti-racist movement in Cuba, from the activists uh, that continue to denounce and protest uh, racial discrimination and exclusion uh, in Cuban society? Following their lead, as I said before, I'm happy to acknowledge my intellectual debt uh, to them. Following their lead, we look at other data sources, um, which are, of course, much less systematic than census data, but that may capture other processes of racialization that perhaps are not made visible uh, by, the census, uh, by the census data. So, and I'm going to now sh share some pieces of empirical uh, information uh, coming from these other sources. Um, beginning again, as we did with the census data, with, uh, uh, with education. You can see here, we have, again, the, the data we have about this is rather fragmentary and incomplete. Um, but it does suggest that um, something may have changed with the end of the municipalization system of the universities uh, uh, after 2010. In October 2019, uh, the rectora of the Universidad de Havana, the chancellor of the, of the University of Havana, um, um, Miriam Nicado, a woman, by the way, of African descent, um, made a claim that became something of a scandal in, uh, in social media. She made this claim at a, at, a, at a meeting at the Universidad de La Habana, in the Aula Magna at the Universidad de La Habana. And in that meeting, she complained uh, that the number of negros y mestizos, this is the label she used, at the Universidad de La Habana was under 5%. And to be precise, 4.8%. Uh, now, when I read that figure, I thought, well, this is a figure we need to take very seriously. After all, Chancellor Nicado, La Rectora Nicado, is in a particularly privileged position to know about this being La Rectora de la Universidad de La Habana. How do we go from the results of 2012, of the census of 2012, to 5% at the Universidad de La Habana in 2019? This would, be, this would mean a massive whitening of the university system uh, in the last uh, decade or so. My sense, based on admittedly fragmentary but telling data, is that that is exactly what has happened, is that the number of non-blacks in the university system increased, of non-whites, I'm sorry, in the university system increased significantly between 2000 and 2010, thanks to the municipalization of the, uh, of the Sistema Universitario, this, uh, this project of creating massive opportunities um, for university access across the island. 
In fact, um, according to data from the Ministerio de Educación Superior, which is the data uh, processed by a sociologist, uh, Alexis Almeida Junco, which I used to produce these figures, the number of whites uh, at universities across the country increased, the proportion increased dramatically between 2010 and 2013, as you can see, from 57% to 73%. Now, on the other hand, we have some data about how people were entering the university, some data by race about how people were entering the university during the years of the municipalization experiment, during the years of the massification, which is on the right side of, of the slide. And as you can see there, this data comes from 2003, the proportion of whites, of non-whites, who entered the university through the municipalization system was considerably larger than the proportion of non-whites who entered the university the traditional way, that is to say, through the admission test or prueba de ingreso. It's interesting that when Rectora Nicado spoke about this in 2018, she wondered aloud if people of African descent were being excluded because they were, they were flunking, they were failing the admission test. The admission test may, have, may, may be functioning as a racialized uh, barrier to Afro-Cubans. As, um, as folks from Cofradía de la Negritud have said repeatedly, uh, the, these admission tests are basically, um, Blacks are at a disadvantage to take these admission tests because they don't have the resources to pay private tutors to prepare their kids to succeed taking these tests. Therefore, the tests, um, the proportion of non-whites succeeding taking the test is considerably lower than the proportion of whites who manage to, uh, uh, to succeed in, in those tests. If all this is true, I would expect that in the next census, that the next census does reflect finally that something is changing and is changing for the worse for Afro Cubans uh, in the Cuban university system. The 2012 census was just too close to the end of the municipalization experiment to reflect any, any shift. But all the data we have since then, which again is fragmentary and incomplete, would suggest that the gap is growing and it's growing fast uh, in, Cuban, uh, in Cuban society in terms of access to university uh, education. For Cuban activists also complain um, that blacks are a disadvantage not only in terms of, um, of access to universities, as, as, as the folks of the Cofradía de la Negritud uh, have stated, but um, they also, the, denounced, and I'm going to quote um, my friend and collaborator, uh, Roberto Sultano uh, here, they also denounced what he calls, I quote, the scandalous absence of black people in important sectors of society, from the media through the splendid tourist spaces and hard currency markets. End of the, end of the quote. Now, the, this absence from the splendid tourist uh, spaces, which are not that splendid, by the way, but uh, you know what he means. And her currency markets are related to at least three important factors. Um, the first is, is the question of access to remittances, uh, which have grown enormously uh, during the last uh, 25 uh, years. Um, it's also a question of access to jobs that pay um, most or all of its uh, salaries in hard currency or, um, or in the so-called uh, convertible Cuban pesos, the, uh, the cook. And finally, it's also a question of a third factor is, uh, is access to uh, the non-state sector uh, and particularly to the private sector because the non-state sector pays much higher salaries, uh, much better compensation than the state sector where salaries continue to be regulated by law and continue therefore to function as, uh, as on their principle, a universalist principle that promotes equality. 
So the first uh, here, we can actually use census data to at least uh, take a peek at some of the ways in which the Cuban occupational structure may be becoming increasingly um, uh, unequal according to race. Because to begin with, blacks, uh, non-whites are overrepresented. The proportion of non-whites that work in the state sector is, is, is larger than the proportion of whites that work in the non-state sector, uh, in the state sector, where salaries are, are lower. Then we also know from the census of 2012 that in, in non-state companies, um, the proportion of blacks is much higher in, in, in the Cuban-owned Sociedades Mercantiles than in the joint ventures or the foreign owned companies. It goes from 50% to 28 or 29. So it is, of course, um, it's widely known that these joint ventures and foreign companies are where you can make, that's where you can have uh, a better salary uh, because these companies frequently pay subsidies and um, complements, um, you know for la izquierda or under the table or whatever that are uh, that create uh, interesting uh, income um, income opportunities for for workers um, but that's not of course it's not only that blacks are the, that the proportion of blacks in the state sector is much higher it's higher than whites or that the proportion of blacks in the joint venture companies or the foreign companies is also considerably lower uh, than white, is that uh, blacks have um, rather limited access to uh, monetary flows, um, basic, which now function as, as something of credit um, uh, markets. Remittances used to finance consumption, and in the 1990s, they created massive differences in access to consumption by race in Cuban society because of the social racial composition of the Cuban American community in South Florida. The money, as one of my collaborators in the island says, uh, in Cuba, el dólar no es verde, el dólar es blanco. You know, dollars flow to the white population. According to the most recent and best executed study about this uh, by Katrin Hansing and Bert Hoffman, it's a study that uh, collected data in 2018, we use that data to calculate ratios of remittance perception, and you can see the enormous gap between whites and non-whites in terms of access, uh, in terms of access to these resources, which are the resources that are now used to finance activities in the private sector. You know, these are these are the resources that are used to create paladares. These are the resources that are used to refurbish a house, to uh, rent rooms, and to host. Uh, to host tourists, these are re these resources now function like capital. They function they function like investment, and therefore they become themselves engines of further stratification and further uh, inequality. And that is combined with historical disadvantages. I showed you figures from the censuses of 2002 and 2012 concerning housing, but everything we know would suggest that the housing situation is in fact massively different for whites and non-whites. And in fact, I think that that is the case and that we can actually get at that using other data or using census data in other, uh, in other ways. Um, Afro-Cuban activists have been talking about this for many years now. Um, in 2018, the Comité por la Integración Racial, Ciudadanos por la Integración Racial, the CIR, uh, spoke about this. I quote, the new opportunities are based on assets that Afro-Cubans lack, like capital to start new ventures that deal with the uncertainties and challenges of the economy. More specifically, they do not have the real estate and other goods houses, automobiles needed to carry out the economic activities that are now allowed by the government, end of the quote. Their assessment is probably uh, correct because about 5% of the more than 600,000 self-employed people rent houses and another 8% uh, work somehow in paladares, um, two activities for which you need adequate housing to begin with or 
enough resources to buy, to purchase and refurbish a house. And those resources typically come from remittances to which Afro-Cubans have rather limited access. But it's, impo it's, it's possible to at least um, using census data and other studies to get another look at the housing situation. So um, on the left, you have some um, data that coming from the 1981 census. And what, what I did here, as you can see, is rather indirect uh, and precarious. Um, basically, what, because we don't have access to the primary census data, we have to work with published data from the census report. So using the published report for the Provincia Ciudad de La Habana in 1981, one can put side by side here um, a couple of interesting indicators. On the one hand, the municipalities that have higher proportions of Afro-Cubans in the total population, like Centro Habana and Habana Vieja, both of which you can see have a high, higher proportions of Afro-Cubans than the population of Ciudad de La Habana as a whole. Those are, what a coincidence, uh, the, those are the municipalities where um, the proportion of people living in solares or cuarterias is also considerably higher. In other words, in the areas where Afro-Cubans tend to live more are also the areas where the housing is worse. And that's true of collective sanitary services as well. A study, a field study, a well-conducted field study uh, in 2005 looked at this uh, housing situation by race in Havana, Santiago de Cuba, and Santa Clara and found that the proportion of whites who live in so-called cuarterias, solares, y pasajes is considerably lower, as you can see, than the proportion of mestizos and of blacks. In other words, folks, there are in fact massive differences when it comes to race and housing uh, in Cuban contemporary society. One could, uh, perhaps explain this as a, as a factor of historical disadvantage, as something that did not change fast enough or did not change enough under, uh, under the Cuban revolution. So all these are sort of structural factors that help explain why Afro-Cubans have been falling behind, particularly in the private sector of the economy. But let me now turn to another area of reality. And that area of reality is quite simply, racial discrimination. Um, it's not historical disadvantage, it's not a vestige of anything. These are practices in contemporary society, and these are practices that result in the exclusion of Afro-Cubans from certain activities. Not only in the private sector, but also, to my surprise, in the dollarized uh, public sector, as in this, um, Anuncio in this advertisement by Terre de Caribe, which is a, a, you know, a stores that belong to Corporación Guy, the corporation of the armed forces. I mean, this is a, it's a non-state corporation, but you know, it's a non-state corporation, but it's not really a private uh, corporation either. Now, frequently what this ads do is not to refer to race directly. This is true not only in Cuba, by the way, this is true all over Latin America. Uh, you don't need to be terribly explicit uh, to talk about race uh, in Latin America. As you can see here, they're looking for, um, they're looking for dependientes, they're looking for personnel. Uh, they have rather interesting and for, to me impossible to explain uh, requirements in terms of height. I don't know who produces this or what is this based on? I just have no idea. I cannot, I don't feel qualified to, uh, to comment on, uh, on this. Um, but of course, um, what I am very interested on is the otros aspectos a cumplir, the other aspects. Presencia adecuada, buen porte y aspecto. And any Cuban knows exactly what that means. In fact, any Dominican knows what that means. Any Brazilian knows what that means. Any Colombian knows what this means. This is a racialized uh, aesthetic attribute that is used to immediately exclude people who don't look uh, good enough to work there. 
uh, and of course that looking good enough or not looking good enough is of course a thoroughly racialized uh, concept. Now, on the other hand, if one looks at, um, at uh, ads at Revolico, which is one of the things that I've been doing for research for the last, I, I sort of save these ads. And the only way by way to do research on this is to capture the, is to capture the screens and to save them. Uh, it's very hard to find like systematic information on this. And I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a couple of those ads here with you. The first on the, on the top, because it caught my eye, because it, this is actually posted by a Canadian citizen who's coming to Cuba and who is basically hiring the services of uh, the sexual services of, uh, of, uh, of a Cuban woman and which he asks must be between 18 and 25, solo chicas blancas, which is uh, the reason I, I saved. And, and among various services that he requires include sex, obviously. <laughs> um, that's uh, so, this is this is published in this uh, platform in which which Cubans use to provide and solicit all, all kinds of services and goods, uh, revolico.com. But the one at the bottom is perhaps more interesting for us because the one at the bottom is a Cuban uh, person who is looking for an assistant de limpieza, a cleaning lady. A, um, and I, I know it's lady because he has um, it's, uh, it's uh, explicit gender specifications here because assistente could be right could be a guy could be a woman, but then he says para casa grande dos veces por semana a reliable lady señora confiable con experiencia y de raza blanca okay y de raza blanca and these ads are not uh, are not rare. Um, in fact, so uh, these these ads are quite frequent. Um, in 2017, when a new nightclub was about to open its doors in Havana, uh, they posted a sign. In this case, it was not online; it was actually physically outside the premise, outside the bar, and that sign said, "Seeking qualified, experienced personnel, wait staff." parenthesis, good looking blonde or brunette women who speak foreign languages, end of parenthesis, and security and protection, parenthesis, strong men of color, end of uh, parenthesis. In sum, the combined effects of a historically based disadvantages in terms of access to housing and other resources, uh, disparities, in uh, access to monetary and capital flows through remittances. See the retreat of the public sector, of a public sector that up to the 1980s functioned as an engine of social equality by distributing salaries and goods according to universalist principles that operated regardless of the personal circumstances of, uh, uh, of individual workers and um, the proliferation of openly racist practices uh, in employment and promotion uh, in the private sector, all these factors combined uh, probably help explain why um, there are massive income inequalities according to race in Cuban contemporary society. Now, these are results from the, from the Katrin Hansing and Bert Hoffman study, um, which confirm every other study that we have, and there have been several, um, Sarah Blue, who I think is with us today, by the way, uh, published um, uh, a very interesting, uh, published int very interesting field research about, it, about this back in the year, uh, what is it, what was it, Sarah, 2010, 2000, uh, which already showed uh, precisely how uh, income differentials were massive according to race uh, in Cuba. Folks note here that basically all Afro-Cubans, all people of African descent in this study are in the lowest income bracket. Only 5% of them are not in the lowest income bracket. Now take a look at people making $10,000 or more per year. You have what, eight, 13, 14% of white Cubans make $10,000 uh, or more 
per year, only 1% of Afro-Cubans do. If you move to $20,000 or more per year, then there is simply not a single uh, person of African descent in this study that uh, entered into any of those income uh, categories. Here is, um, um, this is an x-ray of, uh, of inequality as stark um, as, we can, as we can get. So our assessment is that it is in fact possible to produce radically different narratives about race and inequality in Cuban uh, contemporary society. And that each of those narratives can appeal to different sets of reality and to different uh, sets of data in order to, uh, um, for backup. On the one hand, if one uses census data, one can easily um, find or conclude that Cuba is an egalitarian society and that it is an egalitarian society according to a number of important metrics uh, of inequality that we typically use not only in Cuba, but all over the Americas, access to education, access to some of the most prestigious um, um, jobs or professions, um, access to healthcare, uh, nutrition, uh, and even housing. Although I do think that the housing data, um, it's, it's basically misleading, it basically hides uh, realities that are much more powerful than that. Um, but on the other hand, um, but on the other hand, what activists and anti-racist organizations have been telling us can also be grounded in on solid uh, data. Racial differences are visible. Um, they're well known. They're public. You know, these ads are circulating everywhere. People may not know that 95% of Afro-Cubans are in the lowest income bracket, but they know from their barrios, from their communities, from their social networks, that Afro-Cubans have in fact much lower access to financial resources, either because of remittances or because of uh, uh, jobs in the private sector uh, than whites. These things are visible. They are part of daily life. Afro-Cuban Afro activists and anti-racist activists are not talking about uh, a hidden reality. This is something that they live with uh, every year. And I'm not even referring here to practices of racial profiling by the police and stuff like that, which is also, um, which is also a daily uh, occurrence. So I, as, as one of these Afro-Cuban activists, Manuel Cuesta Morua has stated in Cuba, I quote, racism is structural, end of the quote. How can this, realities coexist. Um, in a sense, we are so, sort of back to the puzzle uh, with which I ended A Nation for All 20 years ago. Um, how can we explain this? Now, I've been thinking about this during the last few years. I've been trying to process this. I've been trying to think about the implications of this, not only for Cuba, by the way, but what do we learn from this in terms of um, um, in terms of policy making concerning race and inequality, we always assume that inequality would somehow, if not automatically lead to, the, this, to, to dismantling racist structures, that at least it was a very important first step. Now, you know what? That first step was taken by revolutionary Cuba and racism, as Cuesta Morua says, continues to be alive and well at the same uh, time. In part, I think what we have here is that Cuban society has experienced something of a bifurcation since um, since the early nineteen uh, since the early nineteen nineties. Uh, on the one hand, um, the public sector continues to function uh, as it did through the nineteen eighties as a space that is guided by principles and that distributes resources in a fairly um, in a fairly egalitarian manner through universalist policies. Salaries are regulated by law, whether you are man, woman, short, tall, you don't meet the height requirements of the TRD ad, uh, 
you still get your salary because those salaries are regulated by law across, uh, across the board. Um, jobs in that sector, in the public sector, the best jobs in that sector, those jobs of professionals, technicians, scientists, used to conquer prestige and also some access to resources in ways that are not true anymore those are not the hardest jobs now as we all as we all uh, as we all know furthermore the, in this bifurcation the public sector has been on retreat since the 1990s according to the 2012 census 20 percent uh, uh, of workers labored in the non-state sector that number had increased to 32 percent by 2019 according to uh, uh, according to Gramma. And, um, and that sector is probably, the non-state sector is probably the, the one sector that will continue to grow in the foreseeable future. In fact, in the last few weeks, as you all know, the Cuban leadership has been promoting that sector, the need for that sector to grow, uh, to grow faster. Non-whites are represented in higher proportions in the now lower paying state sector and are very, very poorly represented in the growing private sector. And this is, this is not just uh, a function of their lack of access to adequate housing or lack of access to remittances, although these are two major factors. It's also a direct consequence of a racist labor, uh, um, of labor practices and hiring practices that tend to exclude Afro-Cubans from those jobs. You know, if you have to have buena presencia and buen porte aspecto, everybody knows that that means you've got to be light skinned. You know, if you look uh, Dutch, but even the even better. Um, you know, people of African descent don't qualify under that. And if there is any doubt, many ads actually speak as directly demand people of La Raza Blanca for for some of these services. Or if you are looking for um, security personnel, hombres fuertes de color, which is what that 2017 ad did. Mine, this is all public, okay? Um, I, I, this is not hidden. This, these are things that are circulating um, in Cuban society. And that leads me to my final uh, question, and I will be finishing soon. And that is, how are these images and this racist uh, narratives produced um, in a society that in according to other metrics continues to look uh, um, egalitarian uh, in the context uh, of the americas is it possible that is it possible that what we have described as an egalitarian educational system in terms of access produces the, the narratives that uh, end up um, recycling racism in Cuban society. Let me show you the results of a study. This is a study that was published in La Revista Cubana de Medicina General Integral in 2006. And it, I, it caught my eye. It's not that I follow this revista every day, trust me. Uh, but it caught my eye because these people did a survey among, uh, among uh, public health personnel, medicos, psicologos, y enfermeras, y enfermeras. <laughs> I always laugh at how enfermeras can only be female in Cuba. Con grado universitario, university personnel. And what they found, I found astonishing. 80% of respondents said that races do exist, that they do exist. They spoke of raza blanca europoide, negra negroide, asiática mongoloide amarilla, and that these races could be identified uh, using different uh, biological criteria. So here it is, in a nutshell, in a bubble, a graphic example of how equality and racism can easily coexist, in fact how what the census captures as an indicator of equality in terms of university uh, uh, degrees may contribute to the expansion of racism and discrimination in Cuban society. Folks, this is a massive failure of the Cuban educational system. 
a massive failure. We're talking, we're talking medicos, psychologists, enfermeros, people who have a university education and who can tell you with a straight face, que sí, las razas existen, and can actually even classify them. It's very telling uh, that in a recent comparative study of intermarriage, um, of interracial marriage by sociologist Eddie Telles and Alberto Albert Esteve, they found that interracial marriage is lower in Cuba than in Brazil, which is of course a much more unequal country than Cuba. Or to put it differently, racial equality in Cuba does not translate into higher levels of racial tolerance. Brazil has higher rates of interracial marriage, even though Brazil is one of the most unequal societies uh, in the Americas, uh, if not the world. Of course, additional empirical research is needed in these and other areas, and we also need access to better data in order to assess better how beyond political inclinations, beyond ideological disputes, measurements of racial inequality are evolving in Cuba. My sense is that census figures tell an important story, but they do not tell the whole story and may even tell the wrong story in, in, some, uh, in some cases, that we need to have access to other sets of data in order to capture very real processes of racialization that are taking place um, in Cuban society. So let me finish with this. Just a few months ago, in November 2019, um, Cuban authorities, uh, the Cuban Council of Ministers, the Consejo de Ministros, approved a national program against racism and discrimination. Um, I was initially, of course, very hopeful about the fact that the Consejo de Ministros would even give any attention uh, to this theme. And then my enthusiasm declined somewhat when I read the language para combatir y eliminar definitivamente los vestigios de racismo y discriminación racial que aún subsisten, right? So we go back to vestiges and subsistence. We are still treating these problems, not as something that leaves in the, in the advertisements of TRD uh, stores, or in Revolico.com, or in the racialized or openly racist practices that are proliferating in the Cuban mass uh, private sector, which is again, the, the only sector of the Cuban economy that's growing, no. We continue to talk, Cuban officials continue to talk about vestigios and subsistence. But, you know, it's probably um, not a bad thing that the Consejo de Ministros have talked about this, that they are paying attention to this, that they think this is, uh, that this is an important issue, and that they promise to create a commission uh, that will be headed by none other than the President of the Republic, President Diaz-Canel, to deal uh, with this issue, so at the highest uh, level. So let me finish by um, asking the president of that commission uh, to make more data available uh, to us, because no such program uh, can succeed in the absence of data and serious research. Research, serious research is needed in order to capture these different processes that are happening and are taking place uh, in Cuban society and are so, diff in it, so contradictory and, uh, and difficult to um, explain. My sincere hope is that this work, uh, the work I do, the work I'm now doing with Stan, and this paper and our results will contribute however modestly to those, uh, to those efforts. And with that, I'll give the, I'll pass the floor to my colleague and friend, Tania Hernandez. Thank you very much. Gracias. All right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, let me introduce our next, our discussant. Tania Hernandez is the Archibald Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law. Her research and teaching areas are in the area of discrimination, Latin American uh, law, employment, trust and wills, critical race theory, the science of implicit bias um, and uh, and uh, other and social justice. 
Recent publications include Racial Subordination of Latin America, published, um, uh, it's a book on, uh, another book on uh, Latino anti-Black bias, Racial Innocence and the Struggle for Equality, Beacon Press. Uh, she has a forthcoming book, uh, Multiracials and Civil Rights, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination, uh, forthcoming in from NYU Press. And uh, she has a series of of chapters in books such as Law and Race in Latin America and the Handbook of Law and Society in Latin America, and also, uh, for example, Constitutional Controversies Comparing Constitutions in Latin America Regarding Race Discrimination in Oxford's hand Handbook of Constitutional Law in Latin America. Uh, we want to, I want to thank you so much, Tanya, for being uh, a part of this, and it's all, you, the floor is, up to, is available to you. Thank you very much. Um, just one quick correction. Um, the forthcoming book is the book with Beacon Press called On Latino Anti-Black Bias. Um, and the one that was published already um, is the Multiracials and Civil Rights. Uh, but in any case, Google me, you'll find it all. <laughs> um, okay, so let me then go straight to um, the comments. Um, I had the benefit of reading the draft of the article and it, it's incredible. I, when it comes out, you all are have quite a treat uh, for yourselves. Uh, it provides an excellent uh, case um, with all, lots of empirics uh, and empirics for doubting of uh, the extrapolation from Cuban census data uh, that racial disparities are not extreme. Uh, for, when it, from, for when it comes to matters of race, the devil is indeed in the details. Um, of all the rich data provided in the article, I have to say my favorite uh, was one that didn't get mentioned uh, during Alejandro's talk, so I want to put it out here, uh, is the observation that while the census data indicates that the overall housing situation across racial groups is very similar, drilling down to the data on household access to piped water, pun intended, uh, shows a devastating gap between whites and non-whites. If you've ever had to use an outhouse or haul buckets of water to bathe and to uh, clean, uh, you can appreciate the significance of such a data point to how lives are constrained and burdened by the conflation of race and class. I have no disagreements with the article. Um, and so instead I'd like to take up the article's concluding invitation to consider what additional research uh, is encouraged and might be explored. Uh, specifically, I'd like to offer some thoughts about other factors that affect census racial data. Let's consider the effects of racial self-identification on the census, meaning you are whatever you say you are in, on the form. Huh? Uh, nobody's checking up on you. <laughs> so in this world of census, uh, census self-identification, uh, we have to consider the fact that this dynamic is recurring in a land of mestizaje and pigmentocracy. Demographers studying Latin America and Latinos in the United States, very interesting convergence there, uh, have noted the rhetoric of mestizaje leads often to white box checking, white or light race box checking, much more so than a visual inspection of the population would indicate is warranted. <laughs> Uh, and Cuba is not unique or exempt from this dynamic. So what counts as race, or should I should say, what counts as white on the census uh, then is much more expansive and black much more narrow, all of which then results in flattened rates of disparity. You've got a bunch of brown skinned people checking the white box, that would, as the statisticians say, confound the data. <laughs> Or in other words, the census racial data is unreliable. Okay, yet there's still ways to have racial statistics be more accurately capturing racial hierarchies that are so poignantly described in the qualitative and ethnographic studies of Cuban and Latin American racism. Consider Edward Teles' 2014 book, Pigmentocracies, Ethnicity, Race, and Color in Latin America. First, let me describe the overarching project of that book and, some, and how it pertains to this conversation. The book's central conclusion is that skin color is a central axis of, so, of social stratification across Latin America. 
the book's major findings are that one, race and ethnicity uh, is multidimensional uh, and can be measured in multiple ways. So that changes in how ethno-racial questions are posed, what kind of language you use, uh, or categories chosen influences how people answer the questions and they can give you different results. Secondly, estimates of inequality based on ethno-racial classifications do not consistently support expectations of pigmentocracy. That is to say, the external evaluation of skin color is more reliable in assessing ethno-racial inequality. More about that in a moment. And finally, skin color is more consistent, uh, but, more, uh, but an overlooked dimension of ethno-racial inequality in Latin America. Now here's where I wanna to get to our connection here. Particularly noteworthy is the book's uh, ability to study skin color inequality in depth by not only using the traditional survey method of direct questions about racial attitudes, but also deploying the device of a skin color palette for interviewers to demarcate the salience of skin color to the results. Here's what one looked like. Um, mine's a little, probably not the clearest image because mine's pretty old, but Eddie Teles let me have this when he was first working on the book. This is the infamous paleta, palette, uh, if you can see, of all different skin colors and numbers marked from one all the way to 11, which allow a researcher to check a box depending on which box they think someone's skin color matches. Now, this paleta, this palette, may strike many people as outrageous, right? Because it's a reification of skin color differences. Uh, but the book persuasively shows that race and ethnicity are not simply a matter of, of identity or consciousness. They also involve the gaze of the other. How can we otherwise properly monitor racial inequality when the traditional manner of ethno-racial statistics gathering, like census data, relies upon the cheaper but more unreliable method of self-identification. Oh, what am I? Oh, I think I'm um, coffee mixed with a lot of milk and sugar. Kind of craziness, right? Census takers are known to avoid asking ethno-racial questions out of politeness. And mailed in surveys are typically answered by one single person on behalf of the entire household, regardless of the variation of racial identity in the home. So if the Blanquita in the household is answering the data for everybody else, you may not get the same kind of results. Moreover, the wording of census ethno-racial questions provides varied results from one census to another. The book shares examples of uh, the Colombian 1993 census question that asked individuals whether they belonged to a black community, like the Maroon Society or an indigenous, indigenous tribe, or one would presume, okay? This captured 1.5% of the population as black. Okay, 2005, the census changed that language in the question, instead asked if a person was black or mulatto on the basis of either their culture or their physical features. That change in language of the question had the black population rise from 1.5% to 10.6, right, with no, correlation between migration, immigration, or a birth boom to explain the sudden increase of black people in Colombia. A similar example of census wording changing results from year to year was also provided for the indigenous population in Peru. Language matters, it turns out. Thus, while it's not expected that governments would shift away, and certainly not Cuba, <laughs> from the easier and cheaper census method of self-identification, uh, the book's discussion of the enhanced reliability of external evaluations helps to support the social justice movement premise that the census data reports of ethno-racial status is an undercount of racial inequality. Okay. Now, this book by Ariteles, though, also resonates with other racial reforms uh, by other researchers. So back in 2010, uh, Wendy Roth authored an article called Racial Mismatch, the divergence between form and function in data for monitoring racial discrimination of Hispanics. Sort of looking at how do people do this when they come to the United States? And she uh, claims that given the significance of how much African phenotype, hair texture, skin shade 
influence socioeconomic status, that interviewer observations using the color palette or good training um, provide greater data for racial appearance as the most accurate tool for monitoring socioeconomic disparities among Latinos of all different shades. But color is more than color in Cuba and the rest of Latin America, where the conceptualization of color is a taxonomy also informed by other factors like hair texture, like phenotype, hence the uh, case of an extremely light-skinned person or even albino looking person still being denigrated as Afro-descendant because of perceptions of negativity with tightly coiled hair and African facial features. This is where we get the term habao, right? For someone who's light-skinned, but it's kind of black nonetheless. Okay. This is in part why sociologist Nancy Lopez offers a different approach to improving central co census collections uh, on racial disparities. Uh, Nancy Lopez's 2013 article, Killing Two Birds with One Stone, While We Need Two Separate Questions on Race and Ethnicity uh, in the 2020 Census and Beyond, she proposes that the census make an inquiry into what she calls street race that invites respondents to reflect on how they visually are perceived by others. Meaning, not what your personal identity is, not what you feel like on a particular day, not what your culture is, but if somebody saw you walking down the street, what would they think? Right? Use that as the place to check the race box. Now, you might think of all these census reform ideas as too radical <laughs> for Cuba, particularly in light of how, as Alejandro shared with us, the article states that in 2012, the uh, Cuba census report opposed the term of just Afro-descendiente, of Afro-descendant, because they thought it was too race-based uh, and linked to uh, uh, a non-Cuban-like uh, focus on marginality and of open discrimination. So let's go full circle to the importance of social justice movements. Another alternative is rooted in the work of consciousness raising of social justice groups. Brazil and Argentina have used community consciousness uh, raising campaigns to encourage a more race-like response to color question. And as a result, increasing numbers of their respondents are identifying with blackness on the census. In Brazil alone, the population, or I should say the proportion of people declaring themselves of African ancestry on the 2010 census rose from 44% to 50% making Afro-Brazilians the official majority for the first time. Notably, Brazil's Census Bureau, their own Census Bureau, attributed the increase in part to the Afro-Brazilian social justice movement's campaign to increase the valorization of identity among Afro-descendants. De Afro in Argentina, after 100 years of omitting a race question on the census, with the national insistence on a white identity, the 2005 census showed 5% of the population as Afro-descendant. Similarly, in Uruguay, after 150 years without a racial question on the census, and the same insistence on a white national identity, the 2011 census had 7.8% of the population indicating that they had some African ancestry. When the 2010 Ecuadorian census reported that 7.2% of the population was of African ancestry, the assertion of African ancestry in such an indigenous identified nation was attributed to the public campaign, identify yourself and your family, proudly afro Ecuadorian. I sum all this by saying that all of this suggests uh, and demonstrates that anti-blackness can be addressed through public policy that intervenes in the flight from blackness on a survey on a census survey. Um, and so these are sort of more areas to explore in picking up the richness of the empirical data uh, that Alejandro shares with us uh, in this article and much more to come, I hope. Uh, so thank you for letting me chime in and I'm very curious to hear uh, what the audience has to say or what Alejandro has to say uh, in response, although I know that um, our time is sort of ticking away, but I'll shut up now.
Well, all right, thank you. Uh, Alejandro, can I pull some questions to you from the audience? Sure, of course. Uh, here, uh, someone uh, says, John Suarez says, the open letter of Brazilian scholar uh, Diaz Nascimento to the Cuban government on October 30th, 2009, highlighted the issue of race in Cuba, linking it to aspirations for democratic freedom by those who struggle against racism who have always upheld the Cuban people's right to exercise full sovereignty, to intercede with the authorities of Cuba for the immediate termination of its onslaught against the civil rights militants of that country. This made a big splash in news at the time. Did it achieve anything in the long run? Um, well, let me, let me refer to that and then I'll, I'll just offer a very brief comment to Tanya's uh, good points. Um, with which I agree, by the way. Um, the, um, the, the letter of Abdias de Nascimento was important because it came from Abdias de Nascimento. And Abdias de Nascimento was a towering figure of the Afro-descendant movement, uh, not only in Brazil, but all over Latin America, a highly respected black intellectual activist and artist who had been involved in, uh, in struggles for racial justice in Brazil and in the diaspora since the 1950s or 60s. The, founder of the mythical Teatro Experimental Do Negro, one of the great initiatives in Brazil, and, and someone who became very critical of uh, the ideologies of racial democracy and racial harmony that dominate most of Latin America. Uh, did, it ha did it have an effect on, on the long run? Um, I think it was an important moment in a, in a, in a very long process uh, of uh, mobilization, mostly by Afro-Cuban anti-racist activists, who since the 1990s were trying to put on the table um, this problem, to call attention to this issue, uh, to call attention to growing inequality, to, grow, to call attention to growing racialization, uh, to processes of racialization and exclusion. And in that sense, it was a, it was a welcome addition. I don't think it's, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think I would be able to, to identify concrete long-term effects, uh, but I do think it, um, coming from him, it, um, it, it, helped to, it helped to amplify the noise that the Afro-Cuban movement was trying to generate. Uh, one of the members of that movement, uh, dear friend of many years and collaborator, Tomasito Fernandez Robaina, always says that the problem uh, it's not silence, it, it's la sordera, you know? It's not that people don't talk, it's that officials don't listen. And in that sense, the letter of, uh, of, uh, of somebody like Abdias de Nascimento and others, because the letter was signed by many other uh, important black intellectuals, um, did have an impact. Um, and I'm gonna second enthusiastically Tanya's, um, Tanya's um, um, call for additional research. I wish, you know, it's not, it's something of a tragedy that uh, a project like pigmentocracies could not be done in one of the places where it should be done, like Cuba. Because among other things, folks, I mean, this is not just uh, chauvinism uh, or petty nationalism on my part. Cuba is a unique laboratory when it comes to race and justice, because this is one place, this is the one and only place where certain policies, a certain policy design based on a number of universalist uh, understandings was applied in a more or less uh, consequential way for decades. We don't have any other laboratory like this in the Americas. Uh, and in that sense, what we can learn from the Cuban example uh, applies and it's potentially useful to uh, to study races, race discrimination inequality in, in other cases. Um, so one of the things that I'll be very carefully looking at is whether with this new commission um, there will be better access to the data exists. The data exists, but uh, what we need is access to that to that data. Data needs to be, um, I, I would call on Cuban authorities to stop uh, treating data by race as, this, as if this was a national security issue. Um, the struggle for racial justice is, is, is hard enough. Uh, we need to produce good results. We need to produce good, good research to inform policymaking in the future.
Okay, thank you. I'm, I have another question. With respect to education, opportunities were greater in areas with lower education requirements, and these opportunities were the ones closed to blacks. The figure would be, uh, the figures would be misleading unless you account for that. That's probably true. It's probably true that, um, that even in during the years that, um, um, let's say between 2000 and 2010, when access to university became more massive, it's probably true that that access was not evenly distributed uh, across uh, different careers, different specializations, different faculty, uh, and different institutions. I get the sense, although I do not have any data to support what I'm going to say, so this is con uh, a conjecture, you know, this is uh, just uh, something that I have thought about. Um, una conjetura, right, is that uh, access to some of the most prestigious uh, institutions like Universidad de La Habana and probably to some of the most prestigious careers within the Universidad de La Habana are um, that you, you would find much, much um, bigger differences there. Uh, what proportion of individuals in jail are black and mixed? The, the honest answer is we do not know the exact proportion. We do know, however, that uh, the proportion of non-whites is, uh, is very large. Uh, according to several testimonies, uh, testimonial evidence, there is also a report um, from the 1980s, in fact, from uh, a United Nations delegation that visited Cuban prisons and that found, detected um, major racial disparities in the, in, the, in the population, in the inmate population. Um, and they actually posed this question to the Cuban authorities who were hosting them, who not surprisingly argued that this is something that was heredado del pasado, that this was uh, one of these vestigios, right? Something that had not changed yet. Um, but we unfortunately do not have uh, precise data on the inmate population. We don't even have precise data on the total inmate population. There are, there are some, some decent estimates, but they're estimates. We don't really have very good data at all on that front. Uh, someone you know, Carmelo Mesalado, wants to make a comment. Uh, Raul's reform started in 2007, but key measures were introduced or accelerated since or after 2012. For instance, the rapid expansion of self-employment and more flexibility in use of proof. Hence, four crucial years are not captured by the 2012 census. Uh, from 2013 to 2016, the latter when reforms were halted. In the surveys he con that he conducted with the team in Cuba in 2015, user from farmers were virtually all white, whereas the self-employed were in large majority white. In last July announced new push on reforms uh, taking place, uh, the next census in uh, 2022 should, well, it should, the next census in 2022 should show the impact of the gap explained. Yes, I think that, so it's, uh, I, I think that I agree with that. You know, I think that that's actually, that, that goes well with what we are finding in other areas after 2010, uh, which is still not captured by the 2012 census. I think the next census, uh, despite all the problems with censuses, as that Tanya, uh, uh, that Tanya mentioned, rightly so, uh, I think that the next census should give us uh, should give us new ammunition and new information on um, on growing inequality, not only by race, but by the way, but uh, on growing inequality in general in Cuban society. Okay, thank you. For those non-whites working in joint ventures and foreign companies, do you have data about differences compared to whites in the particular jobs in terms of opportunities for advancement, salary, and so on? Any data on that? In, in my dreams. Yeah, okay. <laughs> in my dreams, uh, in our collective uh, dreams. No, we do not have, uh, we, do not, we do not have that data. But the question is, um, it's, um, it's, it's a good question because the question is pointing to the fact that even behind 
the, the metrics of inequality that we are able to reconstruct, there are probably additional inequalities in terms of the quality of the jobs, the positions, salaries, and all that. And uh, would you be able to speak on how the, uh, how the census is conducted in Cuba as compared to other places in, in Latin America? So this is a question that always comes up, you know, with uh, how good are, how good is the census, how reliable are these results? Um, my, I always reply that um, um, according to the, um, to international organizations like United Nations, uh, they treat Cuban censuses as, 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 as fairly decent uh, censuses, well-conducted censuses. The Cuban state is a capable state. They, they're able to uh, to gather the information that they that they need, and I have not seen any serious evidence, uh, and I have looked for it. Uh, I have not seen, I have not found any serious evidence that these censuses um, distort reality in any systematic way. Not only by race, but perhaps by other uh, indicators. What is interesting, however, is that. Since only the, the, the only census for which we have a public a sample is 2002. And that limits considerably uh, what we can calculate. That uh, basically we depend on what the government, uh, what Cuban statistical authorities decide to release on, on the tables that they release. And that's why that exercise on the 1981 housing situation, which is basically I'm putting two or three things together uh, to suggest an association. But if I had the primary data, I wouldn't have to do that. I, I could simply calculate um, how many uh, people of African descent are, are living in Solaris versus, uh, versus whites. Thank you. Do you have, uh, do you measure educational attainment in universities by enrollment or graduation? Rates. So, so the census figures are graduation figures, uh, not enrollment. So those are those are people who have completed university uh, degrees. The slide that I showed concerning data from 2010 and 2013 uh, referred to enrollment to people who were at that moment uh, in the university system. Okay, and uh, going back to education. Can you explain what you know about the municipalization system, specific, how it specifically worked? In addition, why, why was it implemented and what year did it begin? And was there a racial gap in higher education in the period directly before the SMU policy like you have studied in the period since 2010? So my, so the, this, um, the municipalization, uh, started in 2000, from 2000 to 2010. Again, it was part of this uh, moment of La Batalla de Ideas launched by, by, uh, by Fidel Castro, one of these uh, mobilization strategies to manufacture consent and consensus. Um, it did create opportunities. Uh, it basically what it did was to um, to create opportunities to, for people to enroll, to take university classes uh, in, in, in schools in different municipalities across the nation. The, those classes were, of course, nothing compared to the regular classes at the University of Alabama or anything like that. And basically anybody could uh, sign up uh, if you had a high school degree and take, uh, and take this uh, uh, these classes. So um, people who are interested in reading more about this um, should basically look uh, at uh, Ulexis Almeida article in Cuban Studies 48. I mean, they'll find much better um, data and description of how the system worked there than what I can that I, what I can do here. Um, everything I've read, including uh, Almeida's uh, own work, uh, Ulexis' own work, is that the quality in that uh, in the municipal system was very low. Uh, but the, it was never really about quality. It was about creating massive uh, opportunities. You know, this is this is something that we Cubanists have seen before. I mean, we we know what this is, right? It's to create uh, massive opportunities. And that, and that, of course, made a dent 
on, uh, on whatever racial inequality may have existed at the university level by the year 2000. Um, we don't really see, by 1981, access to the university appeared to be fairly equal for whites and non-whites in Cuba already. Uh, I suspect that that probably changed somehow during the 1990s and that then the municipalization sort of reversed trends from the 1990s, but we don't have uh, data to, to prove that except a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence of people who in the 1990s uh, constantly said that um, young black Cubans are, were not going to the university anymore, especially because it did not provide, uh, it did not provide a path to mobility. Because if you really wanted to have a better life, what you needed, well, what you needed was, as Cubans used to say at the time, was fe, familia en el extranjero, right? What you needed was access to dollars. So the university, to begin with, sort of lost some of its, uh, some of its traditional role as an engine of mobility and advancement. Um, even, and I think that goes along very well with these figures about the composition of people in performing jobs as professionals and technicians and scientists. Those are prestigious jobs, but those jobs don't, don't pay. Uh, somebody working at a bar uh, in the private sector makes uh, a much higher salary than somebody working at a research institute. So I think that's part of the equation here. Oh, if you don't mind one more question, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, does, does Cuba have a government office that deals with discrimination in employment and housing? It, it has not had such office. Such office exists these days in almost every country in Latin America. Cuba has not had that office. Uh, but now this announced commission, this commission that was, uh, that was announced in November 2019, one would uh, guess that it will lead to the creation of, uh, of a government uh, unit, of a government entity, something like the Brazilian CEPIR, uh, that will deal, that will specialize on issues of uh, racial inequality and discrimination. At this moment, one of the problems um, is that there is no such entity in Cuba. Um, but that's, you know, that's, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's a logical consequence of thinking about racismo as un vestigio, as algo que subsiste, right? You don't really need uh, to create a government entity for that. But now with the, um, with the announcement of this commission, my guess would be that we're probably going to see that. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for really participating in, in uh, this, uh, the Carlo de Alejandro lecture. And uh, thank you, Tanya, for, for uh, commenting on, on, on Alejandro's work. Siga, do you want to say anything? You're muted, Sylvia. You have to unmute it. You have to unmute it. I, I, will I will send to the board as well as to Alejandro all the 21 comments and questions that you got, which I have been busy copying. They were very good and you answered many of them very, very well. And I just hope that this is the beginning, but not the end of a very good collaboration between Cuban studies at Harvard and ASCII virtual, <laughs> wherever we may be. And come back and become a member. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Gracias, Tania. Thank you. De nada.